Welcome to our program on Kardec Radio. Welcome, dear friends, to Kardec Radio at 11 a.m. In our Health and Spirituality program, we are here back one more Saturday. And what a joy. What a joy because today we are going to be delighted to know more about research on the afterlife, on spirituality, on the mediumistic writes, writings of so many. We have our guest, Stafford Betty, Professor Stafford Betty is here with us again. Yes, it's the first time that we're having him here in our audiovisual studio. We used to have our conversations on audio format only, and now Thanks to the advancements of internet, we are able to have this remote studio where we can have everyone here with us. What a joy. And, you know, it's uh, almost December and we're around the corner from a new decade. Yes, the actual third decade of the 21st century is coming along as 2021 is around the corner. There's so much to learn. More than ever with the pandemic and many social, political, economic crises comes along, we're being invited to revisit our, our values, our principles, our thoughts, our feelings, our true inner paradigm. We're going to talk about this and much more. And we want to invite you to this conversation. Feel free to ask your questions. And if you need any particular spiritual assistance, don't refrain from writing to Kardec Radio at kardecradio at gmail.com and we'll be able to assist you in your needs. All right. So Dr. Professor Dr. Stafford Betty, for those who don't know yet, he has earned his PhD from Fordham University where he specialized in Asian religions, thought, and Sanskrit. Today, he's a professor of world religions at California State University, Bakersfield, and has evolved as one of the country's most acclaimed experts on the afterlife. In 2011, he published The Afterlife Unveiled, his most popular book, one that we discussed here at Cardiac Radio. And you can, you can always revisit the interview if you go to our podcast. We have more than 4,500 podcasts at Cardiac Radio. And one of them is this, the whole interview with uh, Professor Dr. Stafford Betty on The Afterlife Unveiled at Kardec Radio's SoundCloud channel. And a more recent publication, the most recent one we're going to discuss here, is The Afterlife Therapist. He has published 14 books, and he um, writes for several um, newspapers, and he is also a contributor of the HuffPost, he has much to share with us. His knowledge, his dedication to an area that interests us very dearly about the afterlife. Some people ask me, well, Manes, I want to talk about this life. But when we talk about the afterlife, we're talking about this life and its inevitable consequences in the afterlife. What is the most intriguing part of it all is that he researches scientifically researches on the many um, writings, mediumistic writings about the afterlife. And he brings it all together for us. He has much to share. There's much to learn. And we're delighted that he's here with us today. Thank you, Dr. Stefanetti, for being with us again. <laughs> well, it's great to be here. <laughs> I think it's the fourth time we've been together, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, you're and, right. Uh, in, in, in the past, I've thoroughly enjoyed you personally. You've been a wonderful interviewer uh, mm -hmm. and you've helped bring me out better. And so we've been able to help each other. And what can be better than that? Yes. You know what's interesting? I want to I share with the public about 
why, for those who don't know yet, why did you decide to be focus on this the afterlife writings? What made you gravitate to this research? Well, uh, it, it probably had something to do with my beginnings as a child. I went to a Catholic school and uh, was educated by nuns, and they were very insistent that uh, this life was very short and the life to come was extremely long. And so I took that to heart and, and it seemed to me that it was important to know something about that very long life that was going to inevitably reach us. Mm -hmm. And so I was intrigued as a 10 year old uh, by what heaven, hell and purgatory, that was the way it was presented at the time, was all about. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was given a lot of information and was frightened into, <laughs> you know, puritanical behavior, as so many serious Catholic boys were at that time. Uh, and uh, I have since learned that there was quite a bit of misinformation that I received and, and uh, I, I needed some, correct, some correction along the way. And I started researching what in the world there might really be that's going to happen to us when we die. And so that was the beginning of it, I think. I also would answer that more logically, um, completely aside from my beginnings and those early influences, it seems to me just a rational thing to do to uh, find out as much as possible about what awaits us after death, which is, you know, right around the corner. Uh, and when, when I, let's put it this way, when I take a vacation with my wife mm -hmm. to some overseas destination, how do I prepare for that? Mm. I buy a guidebook. Now, I want to know as much about Ireland as possible before I get there and begin to hike the country. Both my wife and I are hikers. And it's just not smart to go blind into a foreign country. Mm. Uh, and in the same way, it's not smart to go blind into the next world when there's so much information out there. Mm. I think people who Many people who, who don't look into it are not aware that there's much information about what awaits us. Uh, so many people will say, you know, uh, you won't know if there's anything until you die, then you might find out. But no, there's an enormous amount of information about what's awaiting us. And so it's been my privilege to uh, alert readers from all over the world about what that information is. So that's the way I would answer that question. <laughs> Wow. And, but you know, it's so interesting you're mentioning this because we are living a pandemic and mm -hmm. many people have died like overnight. Yep. Because of COVID 19. And, uh, and yet we, have, we haven't heard of any reports of people changing their beliefs or trying to find some actual consolation. We see every day in the news, at least that's what's reported, uh, the escalation of suicide and domestic violence and people who don't wanna use masks because they refuse to conform with uh, scientific uh, uh, evidences of how risky it is. So we are seeing that no, we are living at a time where there has never been much or many writings about the afterlife as we have nowadays, and yet a time in which people care the least about it. We would yes, say. you would think so, wouldn't you? Uh, there's plenty of incentive right now in our own time for, uh, for at least making inquiries about what's about to happen because death is lurking all around us. Uh, and you would think that... Um, as you say, there would be indications somewhere in the press that people were really flocking to the kinds of writings that I do and the kind of uh, programming that you do. And yet there is no indication that that is happening. And I think one of the reasons for that, uh, Vanessa, is that unfortunately, so many uh, of the, um, shall we say, jet setting, so-called scientifically smart people don't believe there is any such thing as an afterlife. I mean, if you read the New York Times or the Washington Post or the mm -hmm. LA Times, and you look at their opinion pages, not so much the writers who write in, but the, the people who control the opinion, 
there is a tremendous bias against anything that smacks of spirituality. Uh, it's it's a it's a one world type of um, uh, of, of bias that I see in in these trend setting newspaper sources, mm -hmm. CNN and other uh, places like that. It it's it it just makes people feel that it would be stupid to do research into something that doesn't exist, and that is incredibly pernicious. Uh, mm -hmm. it, just to me that maybe 500 years ago, people were smarter about the most important things than we are now. Exactly. Unbelievable. And, and what about the new generations? Because you do you find that the interest uh, to the research you do varies according, according to the generations? Like, for example, the, the youngest ones, mm -hmm. do you think they are more interested on it? Or do you think uh, previous generations were more interested on it? I think, I think it's this way. Uh, we know that uh, belief in the afterlife is high. As churches are emptying, uh, belief in the afterlife stays steady or actually goes up a little bit. Oh. Uh, in spite of all those young people who say that they are nuns, that is to say they are not a member of any organized religion. They're non-religious people, but so many of these so-called nuns do believe in an afterlife. They don't live life necessarily as if they took it seriously, but they they will say on a questionnaire, yeah, we believe in an afterlife. And so uh, I don't think there's much serious. Uh, I don't think we, we need to take these people very seriously. There's no indication that they do any research or read the kinds of books that I write. The kind of books that I write are for older people uh, in the second half of life, generally speaking. Plenty of exceptions, but generally speaking, I think we can say that. So I don't see any kind of upswell uh, in interest in uh, what is so dear to uh, us uh, in the younger generation. I would like to be corrected on that. Vanessa, do you find mm -hmm. any upswell in information or enthusiasm about this? Mm -hmm. I don't. Not at all. Not at all. Not even in the, mm -hmm. in the spiritist community per se. I have to confess, uh -huh. we have put a lot of effort two years ago in um, bringing the Spiritist Youth center stage in our own movement. And we were very disappointed to see, number one, the very parents were not very supportive. Huh. And then the adults, the adults in general, and uh, the youth in itself, for example, at Cardiac Radio, we have invited several people who have a lot of potential to do programs. And... Uh, they don't find it, you know, open, like open mic to them. And mm -hmm. they, they don't engage. Uh -huh. So we see that this new generation, to our surprise, is more focused on the material life than in whatever happens after it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true <laughs> among the young members of my family, dear and delightful people, but they really think that I'm rather strange. <laughs> 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 and so, but I, uh, it, it's, it's strange. It's as, it's as if our planet is inhabited by young souls and not old souls who um, are curious about uh, ultimate uh, questions. It, it, what can I say? It's, it's, I'm just not like most of the people around me. I'm not at all like the people I work with uh, mm -hmm. at the university. These are, they may privately uh, be, interested in what I write, but I, they would never want to admit that their colleagues that ever read anything by me, you know, that would bring them, that would, that would hurt their reputations. So but you know what's amazing about your research is that mm -hmm. in any event, you made it to researching on it. Yeah. You staying at, at, in academia and publishing it. And at the same time, relaying it to the public with your books so this is fascinating because it's it, it's something that is unique nowadays. We, yeah, we it's pretty unique. Uh, and, and and the only reason it happened is be, is that I uh, came to this relatively late in my career, and mm -hmm. after I was tenured and had a full professorship. Mm -hmm. um, and if if I had come to this and shown this kind of interest before tenure, I don't mm -hmm. think I would have gotten tenure. Uh, but they really had. <laughs> they had no recourse except just to tolerate me. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so what I did was to make friends from all over the world while 
making very few friends at the very place where I worked. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it goes, it's a mysterious and strange world, but there mm -hmm. is over, overwhelming interest in the work that I do. Um, if you look at people who have like minds from all over the earth, yeah. there are plenty who do, but mm -hmm. they are still in a minority without any question in a very small minority in terms of real interest. On the yeah. other hand, you know, um, many people uh, are very quick to point out, yeah, I believe in an afterlife thing. You know, they may be Christians and, and they, they go to the book of Revelation and they think, oh, well, that's, you know, that's all we need to know. And frankly, I think the book of Revelation is a big bore, but nevertheless, um, <laughs> that's, uh, if they're happy to deal with that, that's okay. And I think that really many of them are afraid, I'm talking about Christians, uh, yeah. are afraid to look elsewhere. Uh, many Christians are simply afraid of going to hell and they fear that they might be encouraging that destination by looking at the kind of uh, research that I do. And it's a secular research. It's not, it doesn't know anything to um, what the saints of the past or the teachers of the past ha have told us about the world to come. This is relatively new stuff. And it's frightening to many conventional people, traditional people, and they don't want to get, they don't want to endanger their souls. So I have a hard time working not only with my friends who uh, are uh, secularized, but also with my more traditional Christian friends who are reluctant to read what uh, I write. <laughs> so, it's, yes. you know, I feel sort of boxed in by both these sides. On the other hand, there's this wonderful uh, reception that I get from people who are of like mind. And there are plenty of us out there, even though we are in a minority. And we commend you for this because it's needed. And and I want to mention, for example, in Brazil, uh -huh. despite the fact that the country is mostly Catholic, because of the impact of the medium Chico Xavier there, um, he became so respected in the country as a humanitarian, etc., that Nowadays, we have several universities opening their doors to research on mediumship and the writings of Chico Xavier, etc., etc. So it's a new momentum there. And sometimes I talk to my colleagues there and I say, look, we cannot do this here. It's, it's different. In, the, in Brazil, you, can, you may talk about it at some universities, but here it doesn't happen this way because they often ask me, what is it? Can't you do research on this, friends? We are at a different moment in the United States. So when, yeah. when I see somebody like you, I say, you know, you are one of a few who are really at the frontier of a field that may expand in the future. You're a forerunner, you know. Of yeah, a it's, it's a shame that that is true. And, and, and you're quite right about Brazil. It's a unique country. Uh, in its interest uh, and in its openness to uh, this kind of research. Yeah. And it has everything to do, not only with Kardec, who is pivotal, but yeah. also with Chico Xavier. Yeah. Um, but we don't have any Chico Xaviers running around in the United States, no. unfortunately. Um, and if, if, or they may be out there, but I don't think they're gonna get um, much notice. And yeah. so that's just one of the quirks of history that Brazil yes. is so unique in the world. Exactly. And and I, I just want to mention to the public, you've read Kardec's books and some of Chico Xavier's books. Absolutely. And, and what do you think in general? Oh, I mean, you know, I if I were to show you all of the underlinings that I did when I was reading the spirit book, you know, I have it right here somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and we're talking about Kardec's Great works. I've read at least three books by him, cover to cover, and I am constantly underlining. Uh, you know, almost every page is filled with underlinings because I was so struck by the clarity and by the boldness of his vision, which I share. So, yeah, he's, he's uh, a number of books I've simply taken to heart. Without a, he is one of them. Now, he's not the only one by any means. He is just one of those several dozen uh, critical uh, uh, sources that mm -hmm. uh, I've had to to master in order to to, to make to write my books. 
which mm -hmm. basically my books are syntheses of several dozen of these uh, mediumistic geniuses. So um, I, I have no ability uh, along these lines, let me just say right away. But I think that's what makes me strong. I'm not biased towards any one particular um, mm -hmm. point of view or message. And you need somebody like that who has no bias. If, if I were, for example, uh, gifted in this way, if I were uh, an automatic writer or uh, a medium myself, I'd probably be too oriented toward getting out my version of things mm -hmm. to my particular style of things. And I don't have that ability. So I, I come at this without a bias and look at all of this information and then synthesize it. And it, it, that's, that's, that's my strength, I would say. So my gifts are limited, but they're, but they're philosophical and, and you need somebody like me, I think, in, at least in America you do. No, I agree. I agree. And historically, we need people like you who have no bias and who go there, like research and mm -hmm. see what Kardec said. Mm -hmm. That is a must, the universality. See how different people from different countries, different cultures, yeah. they bring the information. They have never talked to each other. They lived at different times as well. And here's a commonality. And then we ask, where does this come from? Because... Yeah. People are telling the same stories mm -hmm. and uh, they've never talked to each other. Yeah. yeah Where yeah, does it come from? Right. Absolutely. That's exactly the orientation that I, I come at this with. And, yeah. and, and for those who are watching us, I want to share that if they want to know more about Kardec, last year there was a beautiful movie that was produced by about Kardec in hmm. his life. It's on Netflix. So if people uh, on Netflix, they can watch it. Oh, it's, yes. Right? Yes. yes, I did see that. Right. Yes. You You're, enjoy it? Very interesting. Yeah. Quite interesting. The struggles of his time, like yeah. facing so much the, 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 the extremes, orthodox religion and the, the orthodoxism in science and this big division. It's like the divorce between science and religion. Yes. It was and all then, there. In right? Power. Yep. And you see Kardec bringing it all together and saying, you know, there's no reason why we need to be splitted in faith and reason. And we're still working on it. <laughs> yeah. And it shows what a strong, what a, what a brave, what a bold soul he was to, to continue to work against all these forces that were uh, set against him. So it's an impressive movie. Absolutely. Yes. But, you know, you've written so many books. We've discussed at Cardiac Radio. For those who are watching us or listening to us, you can go to Amazon.com or Amazon.com.uk and write Stafford Batty. And you're going to find his page at Amazon with all the books, including The Afterlife Unveiled that we've discussed before and many others today. We want to know more about the most recent book, which is something that I want to know more myself. It's named The Afterlife Therapist. You know, I, I have a, a unique um, appeal when we talk about therapy, because I'm a psychologist too, mm -hmm. and when we talk about therapists and the healing process of light, especially during the pandemic, there's so much need for healing. And then you write a book you released uh, two months ago, right? Yeah, just two months ago. It's brand new. Sure the is. Afterlife Therapist. Right. What is the book all about, please? It, it, okay, this, this, is, this is really a, a privilege for me to talk about this uh, with, with you. It's, it's a novel, and it's a novel that's based on the very research that I've done in my, in my nonfiction books. Mm -hmm. For example, the afterlife unveil, heaven and hell unveil, and when did you become ever become less by dying? That's the book that looks at all the evidence for an afterlife. So these are the three major non-fiction uh, non-fiction works that I produced in the last oh uh, uh, nine years. Now, <clears throat> at some point, um, first of all, I, I I'm capable of writing novels. I've written a few before I even came to this this interest, uh, and. I, I decided, you know, people like to read fiction. And when you write fiction, you can really uh, make more vivid 
and more entertaining the uh, the message that you want to get across if you want to get across a message and and i do i don't write uh fiction for escape um uh, on the other hand <clears throat> you have to know how to make attractive a story and uh i have the kind of background to be able to do that with some degree of success and so what i've done was to create this character whose name is aiden aiden lovejoy and he's been uh, a counselor or a therapist, uh, a family therapist back on earth. He dies at the age of 85 of cancer. And we find him in the second chapter. First chapter describes his death. And the second chapter describes where he finds himself soon after his death. And I call this, um, well, I don't need to call it anything. It's just that he is looking at the extraordinary world that is ahead of him and where he knows he is about to enter. Uh, at, at, at this point, he's he's recovering. His astral body is a little shaken by its connection to this very sick, slowly dying physical body. And he needs to rest a little bit, but he looks out and sees this incredible expanse of beauty that is going to be the world where he enters. And so that's how it all starts out. It's a book that is I discovered when I went back and looked at Not So Lar just a few days ago uh, to prepare for this interview, I discovered, oh my God, this is so much like Not So Lar. And yet it, it is not at all clear to me that I had any, uh, any particularly strong allegiance to that particular book. But uh, my, my novel is based on, again, a synthesis of all of the works that I've studied uh, and written about over the course of the last nine years. And so it is simply a, a fictional uh, telling of the story that we find in Nosso Lar as told by Andrew, uh, by Andre Luis. Mm. So that's, that's it. And, and if you were to read this, you would say, wow, <laughs> it's amazing how a guy who, who does research can come up with his imagination based on what he knows and write a story that is so very much like Andre Luis's. So uh, I think that this book would be a remarkable interest to Kardec lovers uh, and particularly those who, who are charmed as I have been by so many of uh, Chico Xavier's works, his, so novels and works, his autobiographical works. Yeah, so you are an educator and you researched, uh -huh. and then to help the public and relay the information to the public, you write the fiction right. novel, so you can bring that information to the public. That's right, that's right. Because I know there are plenty of people who, you know, are not at all inclined to read nonfiction on this subject, but they might be inclined to read a novel that mm -hmm. promises a certain amount of uh, entertainment and, and excitement, and, uh, you know, more than a little uh, inspiration, I might say. There's a great deal of inspiration uh, in this novel. Um, and it, uh, it takes us uh, in, uh, across 19 years after this man's death to his ascension at the very end of the book. Uh, and he's a person who wrestles, as I think we all do, with whether we, we return to Earth for another try uh, or we go ahead into a higher realm. And <clears throat> I have two lead characters. One of them does, does go back to Earth and is reincarnated. And the other one, um, the main character, Aiden, moves ahead. And we leave him in the very last chapter uh, looking over this higher world. I don't know how to write a novel about that higher world. It's too much beyond me. I wouldn't even try it. Uh, but I'm content with the world that is described over and over again, the so-called astral world, if you will, yes. uh, the sources that I have studied. And I have feel confident enough to describe that setting, uh, confident enough to have written this novel, um, having mastered the setting adequately to uh, feel that I wouldn't at least make a fool of myself trying to present <laughs> this world as I think it really is. All right. And then you talk about Aiden, in the first chapter, you talk yep. about his death, mm -hmm. right? And yep. I know, for example, in Andre Louis' book, No Solar, he was a physician, he discarnated, 
and then he found himself in this in between reality, and we That's say right. the lower zones. Exactly so. And yeah. What yes. about him? Does he experience any of it? Absolutely. That's what he. That's his primary job is to work with souls in the in what you call the lower zones, or sometimes I call call it the shadow lands. And he was a counselor in real life, and so he continues uh, his his. Uh, he is encouraged, as a matter of fact, by his spirit guides to give more to the world in the same way he gave it back to uh, the previous world. He's in now living in this astral world, and there are all kinds of souls who are who made a mess of their lives and find themselves in these dark zones. And he is encouraged to go into these zones and try to help uh, these lost souls make them free, make them free of these zones. And, and, and that's what this book is primarily about. His, uh, his, his work with spirits who have been temporarily lost, uh, and he's successful in most instances, but not in all. And, and the second or the, the last third of the book is concerned about the counselor himself. He is not a perfected soul. There's a lot of work that he needs to do as well and so the focus of the book turns away from all the help that he is able to give mm -hmm. uh, to the help that he is able to receive from mm -hmm. higher sources. So it's, that's basically the way the, the, the book works. So we, we come into contact with very evolved souls uh, who are his uh, leaders and, and helpers uh, and mentors, uh, but he himself has been a very effective mentor uh, for all kinds of souls. Quite a few of them, historical characters that I dare to bring into, into the book. Um, I hope I don't offend any of their relatives, but anyway, mm -hmm. that's the risk I took, and the publisher went with it. Um, oh wow! And and then you, there are chapters you talk about the shadow lens as a reference to the lower zones, right? Oh yeah, oh and, absolutely. That's and, where he, his work. Not only that, but mm -hmm. he he does his he does work with. Um, you know, some spirits are earthbound and they they break through the barrier separating the afterworld from our world. And they come down and, and operate as ghosts in our world. And uh, I'm sure you are aware that uh, this literature speaks a great deal about the damage that uh, deeply addicted uh, spirits can do to similarly addicted uh, uh, human beings uh, in the in the earth. At the, at the level of earth, at, at, in, in the words in the physical plane. And so one of the things he does is to work with those ghosts, ghost to ghost, as it were. He comes down into our realm and tries to help these, these sad lost ghosts who are usually not vicious, they're just addicted and they are pulled back into uh, earth's uh, vibrations Mm -hmm. And it's up to to Aiden to help these souls move back up where they belong. And he is successful more often than not. Mm -hmm. But so there almost all of the things that I read about uh, in this literature are found in the novel. One of the most interesting chapters is, uh, and this is the, the most daring chapter, the, the most and probably provocative chapter. Mm -hmm. I read in some of these uh in some of the books, references to uh, other worlds, uh, beings from other worlds that inhabit uh, the our world or even the afterlife world, the astral world, and so I have a chapter about about that, and and uh, I've often wondered how in the world did uh, did the afterworld, did the astral world ever evolve? Where did it come from? Uh, we know quite a bit how the physical uh, universe evolved. We don't know anything about how the astral universe evolved, or did it evolve? Did it take some special creation from some higher power, mm -hmm. uh, or did we, in some sense, uh, create our own afterworld? So these are uh, the most. This is the most exploratory chapter, and it's the one that I would be least likely to say, "Yeah, this is the way it is." It's <laughs> quite. <laughs> but in the other chapters, twenty-nine altogether are very much based on the kind of research that uh, is available to us all. 
It's interesting because you talk about something that is very current to suicide. There's a chapter dedicated to it. Yeah. Can you oh, talk yeah. a bit about it? Yes. Uh, there's a kid who um, races go-karts uh, as a teenager, 18, 19 years old. And there, I did not know that this was uh, a profession for some young men and that, and that there's a famous um, go-kart uh, tournament down in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I have made him one of the leading characters in this book. Uh, and he unfortunately has all the brakes going against him. He injures a person in a race. Uh, he didn't intend to injure him permanently. He intended to cut him off and teach him a lesson. And he's devastated by what he's done to this now paraplegic. Um, and his, his life at home is falling apart. His girlfriend rejects him. His, his, he's doing poorly in school. And, and, and to make a, a long story short, he, he commits suicide. He's, he goes out into the woods behind his home and puts a noose around his neck and, and ties it uh, the other end to a limb and slips off of the limb. And, and, and halfway down, he knows he's made a hideous mistake. Uh, and we take him into the next world and we see how he is helped uh, to come back from that, uh, that mistake. And it is presented as a profoundly unfortunate mistake because it, helped, it hurt so many people. Not only did it hurt him, but it hurt his parents and others who loved him. But on the other hand, I wanna make it clear that suicide is not a terminal tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, one does recover from that. And, and we show how he recovers and how in order to, to make amends, he actually begins to work with other potential suicides uh, telepathically. And, and also those who succeeded like him in becoming a kind of mentor to them. So yeah, suicide is something that uh, we deal with in our own world and, uh, and it carries over with interesting consequences into the next world. And yeah. there's a lot written about that. And this is a fairly easy chapter to write. Yeah, wow. But that's so important nowadays because yeah. how can we talk to, many people have requested me recently like to talk about you know, how to prevent suicide and yeah. from a therapeutic point of view, from a spiritist point of view. We have several books, as you said, including the, the Memoirs of a Suicide by Yvonne Pereira, mm -hmm. a beautiful, beautiful report that talks about the afterlife in the rehabilitation process. Yeah, said, exactly. yeah. it's all about rehabilitation in the next world. And that's what uh, what uh, my hero is, is, is about. It's never about punishment. There's no indication that there is anything in the universe that is interested in punishing anybody. But there's a tremendous commitment to rehabilitating. And uh, that's a very difficult process. And most of us don't take it seriously. Just what you're saying, we need to highlight because in a world that is suffering so much mm -hmm. and uh, many people refusing to to really get real or face the truth, what's most important is to know there is no punishment. There is only correction, education. It's like educational steps, processes, right? Absolutely. You identified in your research across the board that there is this evidence from different mediums that people are reporting to this rehabilitation process. There is always a new beginning, an opportunity for renewal, right? Absolutely. And there's not uh, an ounce of truth in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the scriptures of the world which speak of an angry God um, that, is, you know, that is judging us uh, and that condemns us. <laughs> you know, if there is a God at all, and I think there is a higher power, and I, I think that that higher power is very, very much eager to have every soul, however lost, um, brought out of the darkness. And uh, because we're all, you know, his, her, it's loving, uh, it's love children, and uh, there are no preferences. Um, there's just an eagerness uh, from the very top down uh, for rehabilitation that we can't force it. We're not allowed to force it, but um, we can certainly do the work that's out there to be done to help these lost ones come back. 
And uh, that's 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 one of the great games of life right here on this earth. Yeah. And, uh, and, continues and, on into the next world. Yes. And you talk about the earth. There's a chapter about the earth. There's a chapter about the tsunami. And yep. we want to bring some comments here about your work in this book, the healing, the therapeutic aspects also related to a very critical issue that we're experiencing on Earth, like climate change, global warming, and the need to really heal the Earth. What would you like to share with us in regards to the book that you wrote and, and this the natural disasters that are, you know, coming along as we are in need of healing the earth. Right. You know, <clears throat> this is not anything I would ever dare write um, uh, about and send it to a newspaper, but it certainly does occur to me. And I wonder about this. <clears throat> I wonder if this pandemic is a kind of invitation to all of us to get serious about these major concerns that you've just mentioned. We are, most of us, most earthlings are simply dithering their lives away. They're not really doing much. They don't have uh, an attitude of service. They're not willing to make uh, sacrifices in some small way to make the world safer uh, for the present as well as for the future. Um, one of the one of the problems is a, a terrible failure to commit to uh, something as basic as uh, as overpopulation. I mean, we we are overpopulating this world at a rate that is is drastic, and we need to become more careful about this. Uh, and so it's as if the you know okay. Foolish children, you are not able to control your own sexual appetites. And, you know, this is just a warning. This pandemic is a warning of far worse things that are going to have to happen to control the population of your planet. And this may be only the beginning, a kind of a foretaste of a far graver pandemic uh, that will hit us in, I don't know, in the next 75 years or so. You right. We simply cannot con continue to overpopulate in the way that we do. We're simply irresponsible children in so many ways. And when we behave this way, the universe has a way of <laughs> correcting us. And that correction can be very, very painful. And so I do wonder about the big issues that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and when I see, for example, Andy and his journey, he's reaching out and yet he's being helped, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the good news in your book as well is about the fact that we evolve because yeah. he reaches his ascension. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, we're seeing at a time right now on earth uh, through social media, so much division. Mm -hmm. it, we're, we've never experienced so much extremes in people's opinions. That's very true. I've seen nothing like this before. Like, you've never seen that before either. Mm -hmm. And people say that it's mostly due to the very social media and the, 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 the way it's customized. It just it, potentiates the extremes. It absolutely does. There's, I don't think there's any question about that, that social media is a great thing for people who know how to use it well. It certainly has helped me enormously in many, many ways, but it has had a terrible impact on more ordinary people who never give a who never give a thought about the meaning of life and all they want to do is so many instances is just <clears throat> whatever pleases them and they're not even particularly concerned about reality or truth just whatever pleases them in the moment and they lock into it and they become extremes uh, on one side or the opposite um, and you know that's just not the way the universe is going to allow this planet to evolve. I, I think that we have to do a better job of it. And hopefully that's going to start uh, in a few more months. I, I'm, I'm hoping so, but we'll see. Yes, we, we hope so. And, yep. You know, I just want to open 
a parenthesis here as we are talking about this because you are so committed to educating the people as well through your books, not only in the realm of university where you work, but beyond it, when you publish your book, mm -hmm. you're extending your hand to the to the lay public and saying, look, mm -hmm. this is something that can help you. And you, we know that in academia, critical thinking is essential. Yeah. And is. when you're seeing what's happening, you just mentioned, you, you described it so well about what happens to the general public mm -hmm. and the lack of critical thinking. Yeah. And this is just a, a question to me because I'm an educator as well, and I'm and I have a seven year old daughter, and I'm so concerned about how we can boost this critical thinking in our current society. Where do you think we could begin? Yeah, I think it belongs. I think it belongs. Uh, <laughs> it belongs in college. I mean, there's no question but that people who go to college are going to be taught critical thinking skills if the college is worth anything. You know, you're going to get a lot of mischief coming out of college, uh, but you're going to at least have a better chance of being a critically a critical thinker uh, with a college degree. So I recommend that people go to college. I don't like the bias, the anti-spiritual bias that I see all over the place in my colleagues. I think they do. I mean, whenever I hear somebody's majoring in philosophy, I think to myself, oh, that's a tragedy. <laughs> because, you know, I know what happens in philosophy departments. I've been all around it and kids come out long faced atheists too many times. Um, it's true that their faith was inadequate. It was childlike, but at least it gave them some kind of hope. But when you come out of a philosophy degree in uh, the kind of university where I taught, you typically are going to feel, be made to feel that and a religion is for stupid people, uninformed people, unthinking people, uncritical people. I don't like that aspect of college. <laughs> On the other hand, I very much prize the critical thinking skills that come to us. It, it is of enormous importance, uh, it seems to me. I must say, I'm glad that you point out that my books are read mostly by you know ordinary people, uh, the general public, uh, and they are. And frankly, uh, I gave up on uh, reaching out to academics with these books. Mm -hmm. I do sometimes write articles, and I used to write a lot of articles because it was required of me mm -hmm. uh, for publication. And so I've, I know how to write those articles and how to address that audience. But I think that they are have, have so little interest in what I'm really, what is dear to my heart today, that I'm just writing for more ordinary folks, just good folks out there in the society who are Usually, most of the people who read my books, I think overwhelmingly are college educated people, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, they, they are not academics typically. Uh, on the other hand, I don't have the sense that, that many of them are. Yeah. I don't and, have the sense that many more women than men read my books. <laughs> and, and I would say, when I see your books, it's so important because you're bringing to the general public uh, information. I consider it true information, though yeah. it's written in a fictional way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's information that can be very uh, consoling, healing, and I would say quoting Kardec, uh, when you use your reasoning, your faith becomes unshakable. Yeah, doesn't it though? <clears throat> right. You know, it's, it's interesting that um, I my my color what was i going to say but my my colleagues um uh escaped the, the thought escapes me but yeah. uh yeah it'll come back to me in a minute there was something i wanted to say about the, the the people who who read my books oh i remember what it is yeah i am a member of a closed um society of people who are very interested, many of them with PhDs, almost all of us have advanced degrees, who are interested in this subject. There are about 75 of us. And I can't even reveal the name of it. I can't say anything about the people in it specifically, but I can say in general, at least half of them, as a matter of fact, more than half of them are trying all the time to <clears throat> convince the smart people of the world, the, the PhDs, the people who control opinion, to listen to what they have to say. 
and they're trying to get across the same truth that I try to get across and they are failing and it's mm -hmm. frustrating to them. They're just not making much headway um, in, 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 in those higher, rare, more rarefied circles. Whereas I'm making great headway with ordinary folk. People are swarming to my books uh, and, and they are learning. And uh, I, I think that's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that, that uh, we're going to have a spiritual revolution from the top down. It's going to come from the middle class, from the college edu educated middle class who can think, who can weigh evidence and, and basically slowly change the society. And uh, but I don't see it coming from the top at all. No, you're right. We agree with you. We agree. We're seeing that, for example, in spiritism, like mm -hmm. if we give an example in Brazil, uh, the first waves of spiritists there were from Europe in Brazil. And then the intellectuals who knew French, the Kardec, Kardec literature into Brazil at the end of the 19th century. In the 20th century, we saw it spreading out through the common people. Uh -huh. So you're right. It was this other wave that really make it change. And now we can say Brazil is the most spiritist uh, um, society in Brazil, like in, in you see in the world. Oh yeah, in the world, yeah. And 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 you see in the in the Brazilian TV, for example, the the. The greatest networks they 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 create their programs based on much of this knowledge that came along, but you know I've been in the U.S. for 22 years, and when I left Brazil, it wasn't very much like it, Brazil wasn't as a spiritist like it is nowadays. Mm -hmm. It became more popular in the last 20 years. That's like, wonderful. <laughs> well, yeah. It's a big change. It's I have colleagues at university in Brazil. Who now write to me saying, "Oh, Vanessa, I am a spiritist as well." But when we were there, nobody talked about it. Yeah, yeah. And now we talk wonderful. about it. Yeah, and that's wonderful news. It's possible. If it happens in Brazil, it can happen anywhere. But, <laughs> uh, you know it, and and I don't see that as a put down. It's just that Brazil is is a is a cross section of human nature, and so and so is America. So what happens there can happen here. Yeah. Um, and it, as I say, as you say, it's going to come from the middle class. And these are the people who are listening to what we have to say. And it's, it's, it's just maybe a matter of time before uh, some of that information becomes prominently exposed and respected by uh, the upper class, by the, by the trendsetters, by the intellectuals who, you know, write for the New York Times and the Washington Post. These are the people we really need to reach. We've been unsuccessful so far, but it may well be that uh, those trendsetters' children, or maybe their wives, will put a bug in their ear and begin to force them to take more seriously what we're saying. There yeah. are hints of this every now and then. I do see hints of it, but I just don't see much of it. You're right. And, and the, the topic about critical thinking here, uh, when I read your books, I see this balance uh, because some people write to reach people's hearts, mm -hmm. others to people's reasoning. Yeah. And in your book, especially The Afterlife, we can see, and the other books that I've read before too, it's a mix. It is a mix. You're quite right about that. As right. a matter of fact, the, the book that is most uh, unmixed, that is more purely intellectual, uh, is the one that has sold least. And uh, that is the book that brings together all of the evidence and uh, asks for critical thinking uh, about that evidence. Uh, and obviously it's supposed to take you to a belief that there is an afterworld and, and that we can know a little bit about it. But there's not enough heart in that book. I'm proud of that book and it needs to be written, but it's really not having the success in sales that my other earlier books that uh, appeal more to the heart, uh, or at least as much to the heart as to the, as to. That's a good point, uh, Vanessa. I'm glad you pointed that out. I hadn't really thought about it in that way, but it's quite true. Anyway, this novel certainly does appeal to the heart, uh, and um, and so the the intellect is is much less uh, in evidence uh, in 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 this sort of a 
in this sort of fiction. And, and I want to point out to people that when we write this book, The Afterlife Therapist, I have some chapters here in front of me. And I want to quote a few things here just so people feel the, the writing is very easy. It's very appealing. And you you can feel some people now cannot travel because of the pandemic. But I yeah. when you read a book like this, it's as if you're traveling somewhere else. <laughs> you feel <laughs> transported. To when I'm reading some of the dialogues here and the scenarios, I feel transported to another scenario. And I would say as a neuroscientist, that is as valid as traveling physically. Because you're you're totally transported right. emotionally mm -hmm. somewhere else. Yeah. So it counts. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So true. You really are. And you know, any good piece of fiction, serious fiction, is gonna make you uh, into a more compassionate human being because you begin to realize, hey, this is the way other people think. And that's new to me. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. It impacts. I ask you the ultimate question about the book, The Afterlife Therapist. I want to share a little bit with the people who are here with us. And uh, just uh, I selected here on chapter two. Mm -hmm. And here we have Aiden. He's already in the afterlife, right? And he's having a dialogue. There is a man next to him. Let me just say one thing. I'm going to break in. This is exactly the, <laughs> the reading that I had thought I would do, and you absolutely pinpointed it. So oh, you do the reading. That's amazing. <laughs> I would love to hear in your voice. <laughs> well, well, I can, but but it, it's just astonishing to me that we we think so so clearly and. And, and this is, as you say, uh -huh. a chapter that addresses the non-believer because the person that Aiden is having a conversation with, uh, a person who's died just as recently as he has, as of cancer, who has no belief, he is absolutely certain there's no such thing as an afterlife. And so there he is lying on a bed beside Aiden and Aiden decides to have a conversation with him. And so what I'm gonna do is to simply read to you what you are about to read. And if you'll permit me, Vanessa, Please. I'll go ahead and do it. He says, and this guy's name is Rupert. Uh, Tell me about yourself, Rupert. It suddenly occurred to, to him, to Aiden, that he was picking up in the astral world where he left off back in the physical. He was counseling. Can you believe it? These idiots are trying to tell me I died. Why do you find that? Why do you find that so hard to believe? Rupert looked dubiously at Aiden. Look, friend, I'm a scientist. I'm thinking, I'm talking, my brain is working. It's working better than it has in a long time, much better. If I were dead, my brain wouldn't be working at all. I haven't been able to get this obvious point, this obvious point across to anybody. I'm surrounded by religious nuts and they call themselves nurses. It's amazing. This is a beautiful place, but it must be a cult. How did I ever end up here? Where's my wife? He then darted a hostile look at Aiden. Are you in with him? <laughs> Don't you think it's odd your wife hasn't visited you? I'm not sure she knows where I am. I told the staff to call her, but they said they couldn't. My wife's not with me either. She knows where I am, but she can't reach me. My name's Aiden. He extended his hand and smiled, and Rupert took it hesitantly and shook it weakly. We'll be out of here in no time. By the way, if you don't mind my asking, how old are you? 88. You? 88? Aiden looked around and called out to a nurse. A young woman glided over. Yes, how can I help? Would you bring me a mirror? I'd be happy to. She glided over to a counter and came back with something that resembled a handheld mirror. He glanced at it and gave it to Rupert. Take a look at yourself. Rupert took it and looked. Good God, I don't look a day over 40. What the hell? <laughs> the nurse laughed and Aiden smiled and asked, mind if I have a look? He took the mirror and discovered the same thing about himself, except that he looked more like 50 than 40. He looked at Rupert and said, it's amazing what death does for one, don't you think? Rupert looked at Aiden, stunned. Death? Christ, you mean? No, that's impossible. He put on his sternest face. I took you for an educated man. <laughs> He's educated, Rupert, said the nurse with a laugh. In fact, wait a minute, 
said Rupert, sitting up suddenly on his bed. You mean, you mean, his face lit up. He smiled a broad smile of happy shame and looked around as if he were the biggest fool in the whole world and said, holy shit. Rupert, you finally understand, said the nurse. You get it. She looked at Aiden and winked, then back at Rupert. Now we can release you. And incidentally, back on earth, there's a memorial service scheduled. We didn't think you'd make it, but now we'll send you on your way and even escort you. Of course, no one will see you. It would be like you were spying, seeing who attended, listening to the nice things people say about you. It's up to you. Rupert was too astonished to answer. Aiden extended his hand again, and this time Rupert, with head slightly bowed, sheepishly shook it with more conviction. So that's the way the second chapter ends. We and can't so, you down. <laughs> so, so it's we have a lot of fun in the novel. It's and we we know these types, and 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 the literature is filled with accounts of people who are not aware that they've died um, when they first come over. Uh, I love Right. So they have to be convinced and persuaded, and sometimes it takes a long time. This guy got lucky because Aiden was happened to be bedded right next to him as they were recovering. <laughs> I love the way you write, and I would say, you know, we're we're just around the corner from Christmas, and I would say, to people, please give this book to everyone you know. <laughs> That'll be good, and 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 write and, and write a tiny review of a sentence. That would be great. Right. Uh, book it's so yeah. so beautiful uh, by the way do you already have it in in, uh, in audiobook yes or i do um uh, right. I, I have my first book um the afterlife unveiled has been quite successful as an audiobook um and so it's there and you know if you That's drive right. long distances i would recommend you just listen to that work it, it takes a total of about four hours to listen to the whole thing it's short and I didn't uh, record it, but um, a friend of mine, a fan, recorded it for me. Okay. And um, so it's it's available. Um, the therapist, is it in audiobook format? I beg your pardon? Uh, the Afterlife Therapist? Is the after it no, The Afterlife Therapist has not been out long enough to be yeah. recorded. At some point it may be, but uh, I probably won't get around to it myself. But mm -hmm. if I have somebody who wants to do it for me, I'd be happy to let him do it. So or her do it. So that's that's fine. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. And the ultimate question. Yeah. Before we wrap up, we know Andy, and, the, and this is beautiful. Andy, he has his experiences from where you were reading to us mm -hmm. to his ascension. What is ascension after all? Oh, ascension. <laughs> wow. Um, we're here. It's like you know yeah. when. Very religious. Uh, Ascension. I'm going to read the last paragraph of the book, and I don't know how better to 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 describe it than than this. Uh, but <laughs> back it up a little bit. Um, Ascension is is the is the the option that we are given. We can come back and live another life, and and perhaps most of us need to do that. Most of us are not ready. We've not learned all the lessons that most of us need to learn on Earth. But there are some who have, and I frankly hope I am, and I hope you are too, and that many of our listeners really have learned the critical lessons that can only be learned into a difficult, uh, dense environment like planet Earth. But those who have learned those uh, lessons don't need to come back. And in fact, it would be a waste of their time for them to come back, and they would ascend to a higher world. It, this is this is, in other words, to stay at the level of the astral indefinitely is not permitted. You're not going to stay there. You're going to have to move up or down. Mm -hmm. And so Aiden is a person who is sufficiently evolved after 19 years on the astral level to, to ascend. And, 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 and this, is, this is the way I put it. It says, later alone, seated on a terrace, looking out over his numinous new world, his luminous new world, with its strange horizons and landscapes, a beauty that almost frightened him, as if he were a person blind from birth, suddenly gifted by some miracle with vision, Aiden wondered what lay ahead. His heart swelled as he anticipated what it might be. He imagined himself taking up a new post, quote, in the infinite imagination of God, end quote. Those were his thoughts. 
he remembered a mantra Ravinder had taught him, Arise, Master, and fill me wholly with thyself. And he seemed to tumble into the mouth of those words as he contemplated them. He became aware of a gradual loosening, a surrendering of his old personality, a shearing off all that was old in him. He felt submerged in an immense other that at the same time he felt one with. He felt known and loved by this other, but the eye that looked into him and loved him was the same as his own eye. He remembered the phrase, from glory to glory, he was on his way. He felt that he had just awakened from a happy death. So um, there are many, many worlds, not just this one, not just the physical, not just the astral, but these more heavenly worlds that uh, that uh, hopefully we're all destined for, but are not, uh, we're not, uh, we have to work for them. Uh, they're not going to come easy and not everybody will find them attractive, but those who do will continue to go from lesser glory to greater glory, indefinitely, infinitely. Wow. That's my vision of ascension. You know, I have to say, Dr. Betty, you are, it's service. What you're doing is service to humanity. It's service to humanity because you're bringing new awareness to humanity. You're raising awareness of uh, our true essence. So we, we have to thank you. Well, that's what we're all doing. You're doing it in a major way, as a matter of fact, Vanessa. But that is the one thing worth doing. What else is there to do ultimately for serious people but to, yeah. but to help out, to be of service? Wow. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll be able to have our book club in one of our centers on your book, The Afterlife Therapy. I can see it happening. That'd be great. Club. It will be great. But I want to thank you again for being with us, for your flexibility, for, for being here again at Kardec Radio and doing what you do because you're helping our world be better raising yeah. awareness humanity's awareness so thank you again and again and again and to you vanessa for doing the same sort of thing i really appreciate what you're doing it's not easy bless you thank you god bless you and and friends i would just want to show to the friends i'm going to share my screen here to all of you just go to amazon i'll show you how easy it is just go to amazon.com okay let me show you here quickly there you go. You can go to Amazon and you type in Steph or Betty. And once you're there, you click on Afterlife Therapist. And once you click on it, you will see that you can get a hold of the book and you can buy the ebook or the very hard copy. And it's going to be a delight. So thank you so much, Steph or Betty, for being with us. Excellent. And also the afterlife therapist, it's only cost nine dollars uh, if you buy it uh, digitally. So it's it's not going to put you out in any way. Thank you so much for, for giving me the chance to uh, to explore this with you. Bless you. We hope to have you more often pretty soon again. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, friends, for joining us at Cardiac Radio once again. And stay tuned because soon after this, there's a beautiful program as well with Aron Gandhi and the British Union of Spiritist Societies. A big hug to you all. And don't forget the, the Afterlife Therapist by Stafford Betty. It goes hand in hand with all the teachings we've been talking about. Thank you, friends. Until next time.